Let's open with prayer. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for the technology that we have, that we can share our time together. And thank you for the words that you give us, oh, from so many years ago, to help us think and understand and try to understand the larger context of what our Lord Jesus has done for us. Be with us this morning. May your Holy Spirit guide each one of us as we think and as we pray and as we study and as we learn. We say in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we're looking at Isaiah and summarizing chapter four and preparing to move into chapter five. And there are, if you remember, this was a very, very early book. You don't want to think about Isaiah sitting at a laptop typing this. <laughs> you want to think about 400, 500 years before Christ. So it's being written on a scroll, perhaps not even by himself, perhaps being dictated. And you don't want to think about him having a great resource of library to look up references or to find uh, uh, some sort of commentary to give him a richer understanding of who God is. And you don't want to think about him as having been to seminary where he learned all kinds of good and wonderful and powerful language things and truth things. This is a person in a primitive setting, writing by hand, and we assume from some of the language that he uses that he's hearing this directly from God. He isn't thinking this. He is being told this. Okay. Now, we are re as we read along, much of Isaiah is available in very early form, in handwritten copies, in very old documents. And sometimes just one letter difference makes a different word. And sometimes the letters are blurred. And sometimes we have to work and labor to understand. And so understanding the originals isn't easy and trying to understand all the details isn't easy. So this is very close to work. <laughs> we have to really try to understand. Next time, uh, we'll pick something easier, I think. But we have a lot of chapters to, to go. Okay. To summarize then, in chapter four, we began to really experience that much of Isaiah is pretty gloomy. He's looking ahead and he's seeing life is not going to be good. Jerusalem has been destroyed. Jerusalem will be destroyed again. The Chaldeans are up north and they're probably not going to be our friends. And this is going to be hard. So it's that piece of it is gloomy. But there are little dollops of joy. Nonetheless, although it's gloomy, nonetheless, in the future, God intervenes. God intervenes in a powerful way to create for us an understanding and a mercy. We, this is the kind of book where we remember the words mercy and grace. And they may not be used often, but God is merciful and God is gracious and God is reaching out to us. Think of him as standing next to you with his hand on your shoulder saying, Philip, it's going to be okay. Tom, <laughs> it's going to be okay. I'm here. I've got you. I've got your back. It's going to be okay. Nonetheless, uh, Isaiah is stuck with a lot of difficulties. 
And so at the beginning of chapter four, he talks about uh, how there will be disasters that occur to Jerusalem and various kinds of uh, disasters which are going to be the equivalent of cleansing. We see this in Psalm 51. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and refrite spirit with me. Purge me. Hyssop is a plant bush. Uh, the branch is dipped in the blood of the sacrifice on the altar in the temple and flicked out at the people there to mean the sacrifice applies to you. Purge me with hyssop. Wash me and I shall be clean. So that there is this hope. There is this hope that God is with us. Now, as I mentioned about the, the language, uh, in the Hebrew text, uh, in verse, uh, in Psalm 121, and he will be the shade uh, by day and by night, the he is one letter different from the way it is often presented. So what we're going to do is say, we're going to try to get the basic understanding of how Isaiah, so long ago, okay, almost 3,000 years ago, Isaiah in a different culture, in a different time, with different experience, without a commentary, <laughs> and without a seminary graduate to lead him in his thinking, is going to try to understand who God is. And God's going to help him. As I said then, finally, from the language, it sounds like Isaiah is saying that this is essentially being dictated to him by God. He says, I hear the voice of the Lord speaking to me. And he said, right. okay, take a deep breath. Everybody take a deep breath. Now we're going to look at chapter five. And there's a long love poem. It's kind of neat. I'm going to take the time to read it because it's so lovely. He begins chapter five. Let me sing. Let me sing. What a way to start. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on very fertile land. This scripture often uses the vineyard image. And the commentaries I read point out several things I hadn't really thought about. The vineyard is where grapevines grow. But they're often growing on a hillside. And it's rockets. You got to rid of, get rid of the rocks. You got to plant the vines. You've got to plant poles and lines for the vines to grow on. You've got to build a stone wall around them to keep the sheep and the animals from coming up and in and eating the vines and eating the grapes. Then you've got to build a wine press. And then you've got to pick the grapes and stomp on them to get the juice. And then you've got to process them to get the wine. That's a lot of work. But that's the image that's used. That's the image that's used to say, this is what our life will be as believers. We can, it isn't going to be easy. You aren't going to be able to sit quietly with your coffee on the back deck and meditate in the sunshine. The rains will come and you'll have to work. Okay. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved, he says, thinking here to yourself, who's the beloved? You need to think about that. 
my beloved had a vineyard. He digged it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. Oh, no, it just yielded wild grapes, not good juicy ones. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me in my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I look for grapes, why did it not yield grapes? Why did it yield wild grapes? Now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. What's he been talking about? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is God's city. And he's saying that it's like a vineyard that he's going to let be destroyed. This isn't a good sign for Jerusalem, is it? And for the Jerusalem here standing for the nation. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice. He planted the vineyard. He created the people of Israel. His people. His people to do his will. His people that he had high intentions and great hope for. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. That is, he had created this vineyard. He created the nation. He had expectations for them that he, they, they would show justice, and they haven't. We often use this kind of passage and similar ones that we're going to come to, to think about our church, not just chapel by the sea, but the kingdom of God as his vineyard, the vineyard he's planted, the vineyard he is invested in. And what is he invested in this vineyard? His son, Jesus, his life, his sacrifice, He's invested his Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and illumine us and to give us a good sense of what he wants from Philip today. What's Philip supposed to do today? What's Chuck and Deanna supposed to do today? He has hopes for us. He has hopes for Mary. What's Mary supposed to do today? It's not just far off but it's today. And so we see this, the, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts, for the vineyard of God, is the house of Israel. And we can now edit this to say, it's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the collection of his people under the guidance of his Holy Spirit. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. We read of extreme churches who do violence to people in the name of God. We read of extreme denominations who do violence in the neighborhood, violence in the culture in the name of God. Bloodshed instead of love. Pain instead of mercy and love and forgiveness. And so our ministry needs to be something other than the infliction 
of evil. Now, there are, uh, the commentary points out all sorts of interesting wordplay. Uh, this is a very bright man who's thinking and writing this, so that in the original uh, language, there is not puns quite so much, but similar words and wordplay. Uh, so for instance, I look, he looked for justice and behold bloodshed. And the justice and bloodshed are very similar. They, di they differ only by a single letter. Mishpat and Mishpak. And uh, for, he looked for righteousness and behold a cry for help. Again, just a single letter difference. So these aren't puns. But these are the skilled writing of good writers, skillful writers, trying to make something well worth listening to. Okay, time for another deep breath. Comments so far? Okay. So we go to chapter five, verse eight. And <laughs> there are some interesting things here. The commentator talks about the seven woes. Oh, woe is me. Right? Is things that God sees the Israelites doing that are in opposition to his expectation and his teaching. Now, we have a much rich, richer source of teaching, don't we? We've got the whole of the New Testament. And then we got the, the ministry and the words and the sermons of our Lord Jesus and the wonderful explications from the Apostle Paul. They didn't have all of those. But they had some. And in this, Isaiah is going to spend some considerable period of time uh, talking about woes. The first woe. You ready? You, may, you could have these tattooed on one of your arms. <laughs> that, that would be a good way to remember them. Woe. Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field until there's no more room and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses, empty, without inhabitant. For 10 acres of vineyard shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall lead, yield but one epath. Bath and epath are early measures uh, of volume that are used in farming. So we're not going to worry about them at this point. But look at these. The first thing he says woe to are those who are greedy. Right. Who reach out to make, to take more, to expand their holdings, to control the neighborhood to control the agriculture. Greed, greed, greed. First of all, for those who are greedy, God, he says, the Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing. Oh, that's a powerful statement. He's saying God himself says to Isaiah, I swear to you, they're going to be punished. That's, that's pretty scary. The pastor Mark calls you up and says, the Lord God appeared to me today and said, Philip is going to get it. I need to take that really seriously. So does Tom and so does Jock and so does Mary. And, and so we say, the Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing You've made all these beautiful houses. Surely many houses shall be desolate. Large and beautiful houses. 
without inhabitant, and the agriculture itself will fail. That's pretty serious. He's talking about desolation. In these beautiful neighborhoods with the great beautiful homes, the homes are empty. The fields have failed and all of the plants have died. Whoa, and who is this happening to? Well, we don't yet know yet, do we? Yeah, but woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field. Woe to those who are greedy. greedy. My car is at least six months old. It's time to buy a new one, right? My house is no longer the most expensive one in the neighborhood. It's time to buy a new one. Uh, the people, those who are not looking inward at the presence of God, but outward at their status. That makes sense? That's the first woe. Isaiah is not saying, it seems to me that what greed is a bad thing. What does he say? The Lord of hosts has said to me personally. Okay, so on our list, we start with greed. Second on the verb, oh, verse 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning. That sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Rise early in the morning yeah. in order that they may run after strong drink. Oops, <laughs> that's not so good. Who tarry late into the evening till wine inflames them. They have wire and harp and timbrel and flute and wine at their feast, but they do not regard the deeds of the Lord or even see the work of God's hands. Now, this isn't the sort of thing I grew up in with in my little Baptist church. All alcohol is bad, or you should never have a single drink or anything like that. It isn't that. It's those who are emphasizing and making it a controlling part of their life. And I think we could probably say we could extend this to anything else that we make to be a compulsive, arrogant, focus, whether it is uh, smoking marijuana or it is spending too much time walking on the beach. <laughs> it's the things that we do that cause us to stop regarding the deeds of the Lord. That makes sense? We are to be paying attention to what God has done and paying attention to what God is doing. Woe to those who join house to house. Woe to those that run after strong drink. And then a therefore. There's going to be some more woes, but there's an editorial statement here in verse 13. Therefore, my people go into exile for want of knowledge. Their honored men are dying of hunger, and their multitude is patched, parched with thirst. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure, and the nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude go down, her throng. And he who exalts in her, man is bowed down, and men are brought low, and the eyes of the haughty are humbled. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice. 
the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness, then shall the lambs graze as in their pasture, fatlings and kids shall feed among the ruins. It's useful to, to look at the structure. Therefore, but, and then, to make a sense of what he has to say. He said, first, there is greed, and secondly, there is drunkenness, and they are both have to do with failing to pay attention to God and failing to pay attention to what God is doing. And I think we can assume also failing to pay attention to what God wants for us today, wants us to do today. And he says, therefore, that's the first one. Therefore, my people go into exile. Therefore, Sheol, which is not quite our image of hell, but a godless, aimless existence in the fog, sort of. Therefore, my people go into exile. Therefore, Sheol has opened its appetite, and man is bowed down and men are brought low. Man is brought down. But the low, but in spite of this, the people have been sent into exile. The people have been punished. But that, what that means is the Lord, but the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice. What happens God regards as just. And then the lovely image, and the lamb shall graze as in their pasture. There's peace. There's prosperity. It's going to be okay. So look at all that's packed into these verses. In verse 8 and verse 11, the sins of the people. Does our culture experience those sins even today? Absolutely. <laughs> you better believe it, right? Yeah. There are people choosing excess. There are people choosing violence. There are people choosing drunkenness and sin. After that dreadful shooting of the children this week, to hear that the young man, only 18, who had done it, had then killed himself. And oh, how sad. Did your ear, eyes tear up as mine did at the death of the children, but also the loss of the one who did it. He sinned. But he was aware of it, and he killed himself. No, he didn't. Men is bowed down. Men is bowed down. But in spite of it all, we sit back in our chair and we say, none the less, God is just. None of the less, God is holy and righteous. And if we could only find ways to pull the holiness and the righteousness together, then the lambs will frolic in the field and it will be okay. It's not okay yet. It's not okay yet. And we go on with some more woes. Can you handle some more woes? Woe. We have two, greed and drunkenness. Thirdly, in verse 18, woe to those who draw iniquity with iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes, who say, let him make haste, 
Let him speed his work that we may see it. Let the purpose of the Holy One of Israel draw near. Let it come that we may know it. Woe to those who try to make their sin an important part of their life. Yet in spite of that, who will say that God speed his work, that the purposes of God become visible to us. And then verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who try to deceive us by mislabeling misadventures in the world and mislabeling sin. Yes. This is an evil, but there are people that were going to call it good. This is good, but there are other people who are going to call it evil. There are going to be people attempting to deceive. There are going to be people attempting to lead us astray, to lead us away from God. There are all, let's think of them simply as enemies, okay? There are always going to be enemies who try to misrepresent who God is and what he expects. So woe to those who call evil good. My neighbor is starving and needs some food. Yet some will say, ah, serves them right, maybe they'll learn from that. They should have said more money when they were still working. Have you heard people do that? Perhaps you have. They look at the disasters in the world and they say, well, it's a good thing. Maybe a little learn. You hear that sometimes about pain. Well, pain is a good way to teach you. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> I'm currently going through a period of time where the damage to my spine radiates down and makes my legs, particularly my knees, hurt. So I hobble along with a cane, hobble, 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 feeling 127 years old. <laughs> I hope I don't have a whole 40 years to 127 in order to, <laughs> to continue hobbling. Okay. And then some interesting woes. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. One of the things, I was a college teacher most of my career, and teacher and administrator, and it was amazing how some of the folks that I knew were intelligent enough to get PhDs and get a job at a university and so preoccupied with their own wisdom and their own standing, they weren't sensible and they weren't humble. It was a good experience then ultimately to work primarily at Christian colleges where this didn't happen as much. But a person can be very wise, or a person can think they are wise mm -hmm. and believe that they are shrewd, but not be. Woe to them, he says. Woe to those who are, <laughs> here's a lovely phrase. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine, and valiant men in mixing 
strong drink. Oh, I could remember as a kid uh, in college, people bragging about how much they drank the night before or bragging about how much it, I can drink a whole bottle of wine. It doesn't affect me at all. Ha ha. Oh dear. Isaiah has something to say about them. And then woe to those who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. For those who are willing to accept a bribe in order to let a bad person go free and who are willing to let an innocent person be deprived of what is rightfully his. So let's take a, another deep breath and think, what is it you suppose the woe means? When I say woe to those who call evil good, what is it that Isaiah is saying or thinking or wishing? Can you think of a way to express it simply? What does the woe mean? But you're not volunteering with any enthusiasm. Yeah, you know, I would think it is something there to be careful of because this can really get you in trouble and be devastating to you in the in eyes of the Lord. Good, good, good. Thank you. Exactly that. I think Mark, you were going to say something. No, I, I just, all of these woes, again, it's just, I just reminded of a, of a horse that's, that's going not the way you want it to do. And you go, whoa, whoa, as it drags you under a branch and you get knocked off. So <laughs> <laughs> these are the woes that he's talking about, you know, pay attention. Part of, of the implication as he goes through this is the woe is God seeing that the consequences of your behavior are what your behavior deserves, right? You, you look at <laughs> even our grandchildren who are just delightful and I love them to pieces, have energy, little PJ particularly, little PJ, he's got so much energy. And he's got so much enthusiasm and he just delights in finding ways to create chaos and drama. <laughs> uh, and you can think to him, oh, there are going to be consequences for that kind of behavior sooner or later. When you get to high school, that won't be expected and uh, tolerated anymore. Whoa, whoa. The way of seeing it, I think, is that there will be consequences to our behavior. And it's not so much that if you're a good boy and do three good things, God loves you more. Or if you're a bad boy and you do four bad things, God loves you yet less. But it's more that when you do the good things, Things happen in the world in positive ways or negative ways. He goes on to express that in some, uh, at some length, when you do good and when you do evil, if you look at verse 24, right? therefore, he says, well, that's good. We've been looking for that. There was... In verse 13, therefore my people go into exile. Now we get the conclusion. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble, and as the dry grass sinks down in flame, you've seen on television the results of the drought 
that much of Oregon is experiencing and a small fire starts in the woods and what happens? Acres and acres and acres burn. No, he says here, imagine a large field of wheat and it's been harvested and now the summer sun is baking the stubble out there. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble and as the dry grass sinks down in the flame, even so, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will go up like dust. For those people that he said woe about, there will be consequences. And the ultimate consequence is lack, lack of permanence. As the dry stubble burns quickly, as the dried field burns quickly, as the dried forest burns quickly, it's as if the roots are rotten, they're going to be gone. Why? For they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Uh, that gives some wonderful opportunity to think, I think. They have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts. God, holy God, has spoken. Where has he spoken? In the scripture, through our pastor, through your pastors when you were in youth group in college. God has spoken in many ways to you. We had, I had a really good youth pastor at First Baptist in Eugene. And I was trying to remember his name and I couldn't. But if I come up with it eventually, I'll let you know. But as the, the pastor has spoken God's words, as the scripture has God's words, we have heard the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Lord of the Holy One of Israel. Those, wor those words, those laws are in part, don't do these things, but they're also be sure to do these. He just said, don't get drunk and go frolicking in the street. But in other portions, we're going to see he's saying, be kind to the homeless. Support the needy. Reach out with the gospel to the lonely. There are positive things that are part of the law and negative things that are part of the law. If you don't, we go down to verse 25. Therefore, there's another therefore, right? The first was the tongue of fire. And now analogous to the tongue of fire is the anger of the Lord. It's fun to sit and think or scary, okay? however you want to put it, of God being peeved with you. If God says, Philip, is really messed up, I'm angry. What's Philip going to do? We need to think about that, okay? Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he stretched out his hand to them, against them, and smote them, and mountains quake, and their corpses were as refuse, in the midst of the street, for all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. He walked away from the law of God. They rejected it. They despised it. But God is unchanged. 
and his law is unchanged. And for those who reject the law, God's hand stretches out. The anger of the Lord was kindled against his people. I like that. Isaiah is quick. To, now remember, Isaiah right very early. Okay? But he sees that even those people, particularly the city of Jerusalem, for much of this is about what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was God's city. Jerusalem was where God's will was to be done. In many cases, then many times, Jerusalem didn't. And God's hand was stretched out and he smote them. To smite is to hit. Smote is the past tense. And you don't get a chance to use that word very often. You could try working into a conversation this week just for fun. But God's hand smote them. And the mountains quaked. And the, he smote them with violence. We sat looking at the surf last night. And I was thinking about this passage a bit. And of the great earthquake that could come. And the tidal waves beating against the shore. And the mountains behind us erupting. The hand of God both of them. His anger was kindled against his people and their corpses were as refuse. The bodies of dead people littered the street like garbage. His anger is not turned away. These woes are really complicated. And each one of them deserves more st uh, study. The commentator talked at length about the story of Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings 21. Now you probably haven't been reading 1 Kings 21 this week, but it's something to go back and look at. Naboth had a vineyard. And Naboth had a good vineyard. And King Ahab coveted it. And he offered to buy Naboth's vineyard, and Naboth didn't want to buy it. No, he didn't want to sell it. So he had Naboth, the king had Naboth killed on a trumped up charge and just took possession of the vineyard. The key issue in land possession is that the God expects the land to be maintained. What he gave to a family, what he gave to Israel needs to be maintained. Another important point to remember about this first woe is that land, property, is, if possible, to be shared. If it finds its hands, its way into the hands of an individual who won't share it, that defies God. In the Old Testament, all the way back to Deuteronomy, when you harvested your field, you were to leave the grain at the edges of the field unharvested so the poor could come and get it. That was a sharing of the land. But the phrase joining field to field means cutting down that shared. Add that field next to yours, to yours, so that shared grain is gone. Israel wasn't very large. They had limited land. 
And so land was important. The other thing to be particular note about here is that the prophet Isaiah is very clear. These things he's talking about, he heard directly from God. That God regards greed as bad. He said so. Again, you get the sense of God standing next to him, telling him, if greed is bad, sloth is bad. Both of those greed things, greed and sloth, are sins against the poor. God, who created you, God, who created me, also created the poor, also created our society, and also created a role for us. So that we can, as we think about God's judging us, as we think about our circumstances, we can say, God created me. God created the resources that he has given to me. And God has created the needy, the poor, the unfortunate, the benighted out there for me to be aware of. That's part of my creation. We certainly see it much more richly presented in the New Testament, but it's not just the New Testament. This goes. As we were going through these woes and sins of this chapter, I couldn't help but equate it to our present day living. And you know, the responsibility for each of us is to stand up and be recognized for what we want to happen. And I think uh, we need to take our politicians, the senators especially, in our consideration, and they're gonna make a roll call of who votes against some of the restrictions of guns. And I think that's good. And then they further said, hold them accountable at the midterm election. And I think we should. We, we studied this lesson, but there's good that we can apply right here today. Any luck there getting us back? <laughs> oh, there you go. So no, the internet went down completely at their house. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. We're gonna. It's a good lesson, Phil. Yeah, it was. Thank yeah. you, Mark I will, and Phil. I will, I will pass that on to Phil, and thank you, Deanna, for that. And I'm just going to close this with prayer. And okay. Thank you, Mark. God, we do thank you. We thank you for bringing us together far and wide. We thank you for the lessons that have been handed down for thousands of years. Those woes where we need to pay attention to to not do it out of our own selfish ambition in life, but to look to how to love one another and to recognize and to see that this is your creation, God, for all people. Help us to be slow to judge and quick to love. Bring us back together and help Phil and Bonnie to get their internet connection back again. And this we ask God, amen.